Okay, so a poet in the landscape, Mona Douglas and her island magic, and the capitalization in island magic is deliberate. We have sold beauty for a worthless thing and killed the bird of joy upon the wing. Have we? Well, the words of Bona Douglas in a poem published during the Second World War. Throughout her long life, she would explore and celebrate the natural world, its beauty and variety. But she was always aware, as we are now, of the threats to its survival. Well, as the focus of the talk is poetry, and it might not be the sort of poetry you like, so if you do fall asleep, I won't hold it against you, but I like it, so you get a nip. <laughs> I'll be concentrating on that time of her life when she was writing or publishing it. So that's up to the 1950s. And you'll hear some extracts from the work, not always the whole poem. Um, so that might whet your appetite for more. And if you do want more, um, I'll, you can talk to me afterwards. It's not always easy to track, out, to tra track down how to find it. Okay, so to set the scene, let's start with her as a teenager, writing to a friend in Douglas. I only feel a piece taken care of and part of a whole when outside in the elements. And I'm sure many of us might agree with that. So let's get out walking with Mona Douglas and explore her island magic. Wait, watch. What do you see? The stiff black bough of a naked tree, a road that shines in the frosty gloom, mountains rich with a grape-like bloom, hazy boglands and shores that lie broadly glistening bare to the sky. Hush, listen. What do you hear? The far sea droning deep and clear, rustle of reeds in a quiet pond, wind on the marsh and in woods beyond, are unseen wings beating far and high through the pure cold green of the evening sky. So there's Mona taking the advice of all poets at some point. Luke, listen. And in the final verse that I didn't quote, feel. And Mona did feel very deeply. So what about her? Well, she was born in 1898 to Manx parents who were then living in Liverpool. And like many emigrants from the island, that sense of being an exile from her Manx home was always going to shape her. And coming and going over the sea between Liverpool and the island gave her a deep sense of connection to the ocean. But much of her early life was actually spent with her mother's parents in Lazare and later up in Bolarath on the hills above Laxey, which what became Mona's future home. Now, whereas a free spirit on the island, her life back in Liverpool with no school attendance must have been like living in a sort of literary salon, really, for there were always friends of her parents popping into the house. There were musical recitals and reading and discussion of poetry. So she heard a lot of things. She was an only child, took it in. From the age seven, she knew she wanted to write too. And the poet who really influenced the direction of her life was the great Irishman W.B. Yeats, whose poems, The Celtic Twilight, grabbed her own imagination. By 10, she'd saved up enough pocket money to buy a book of his. In Yeats, she encountered a world she had sensed already, one of ancient presences, brooding powers, the old fairy beliefs, offering something new to a very Anglo-centric world. With her mother's encouragement, Mona was soon submitting poems to competitions on the island and in England, and she was a child to watch indeed. But all writers do need something of their own to write about, so of course Mona turned to her beloved homeland. Now, I've mentioned her lack of schooling, and Mona claims to have run wild while on the island, probably around here somewhere, and if so, it did her no harm. 
not only giving her material for the poetry, but the opportunity to meet and learn from those who were living and working the land. And she often helped people out with our jobs too. She was surprisingly strong and practical, in spite of having been once considered sickly. In her 80s, my own family once passed her at the side of a road in Lazare, and she was lifting an enormous sheep back over the hedge. <laughs> and she, she was always at ease with animals, and back over went the sheep very easily before we'd even managed to get out of the car to assist. Um, yeah, that sums her up, really. Through her parents, Mona met Sophia Morris, the great collector, Manx language campaigner, and organiser of the very lively Manx cultural revival movement um, that had been going on in the early 20th century. And from Sophia, Mona was given a notebook to write things down on her travels, the customs, songs, stories that she encountered. Mona became a collector. By 13, her poetry notebooks were also filling up fast. Now, we're going to hear two verses from an early poem about Car and Mattled. That's north of Balarach um, and out past the Dool. It's a song of the exile longing for home. It's been set to music by Dave McLean and sung by Greg Jockin at a celebration of Mona's life some years ago. When the harvest fields are brown When the countryside is smiling In its gorgeous autumn gown I'll be home again familiar When the year is on the turn And the autumn sun is ripening The blackberries uncurl so I'm going back to Cardo When the crimson sunset glow Lies the fields and glen and mountain And the birds, the birds are singing low Oh, I'll take the track Across the hills where the heather blossoms blow, and across the rushy glenland to the little farm below. While the glow of sunset lingers with a radiance sweet and pure on the little mill beside the stream and the shady cattle. So I'm going back to Cardo When the crimson sunset glow Lies o'er field and glen and mountain And the birds, the birds are singing low Yeah, what? Um, my song, a maiden song, her first book, came out in 1915, when she was 60 and living in England again. And it was one of a London published series, and it included that Cardle poem and 25 others. What about it? Well, there were a lot of fairy presences in Manx Song and Maiden Song, and flowers and music and weather, which might not sound that exciting or original, but there's a depth to what she writes. And it's always very well crafted and often beautiful. Although well, it War One was probably not the best time for a debut of lyrical poetry on broadly rural supernatural themes, written by a girl from an obscure island on the edge of empire. I doubt that would have concerned her one bit. I write about the island just because it's the island, and because I am Manx and proud of it she announced. Some on the island were delighted with the rising talents of our young poet. 
One of Mona's friends over many years was the Manx folklorist W.W. Uh, w. Walter Gill. In 1960, he'd written, and I don't know if he ever actually published it, but it was in Mona's papers, he'd written an affectionate spoof on his friends in Manx Celtic circles of the time, the antiquarians, historians, and language activists. But the following lines must surely be about Mona. Mistress D's neo-Celtic news trips in Karens instead of shoes. Karens were the traditional footwear formerly worn by the Manx peasant. So yes, she would indeed loop backwards when new poets were forging new territory, but in some ways she was very much ahead of her time. In 2000, not 2000, in 1917, Sophia Morrison died, and that left a huge gap in cultural circles. She was like the beating heart of, 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 of that culture. Mona stepped in to become a very young editor of the final edition of that excellent journal, Mammon, to which she had contributed poems herself in previous years. And here, in that final edition, is a poem in memory of her mentor. We walked among the mists in eager quest of fairy lore and talked with eyes aglow of all the strange invisible things that go about the sea-girt land we love the best. And ever the grey winds whirled and took no rest, the waves came sliding inward soft and slow and wheeling gulls troubled dim sands below, and cold, wet winds came blowing from the west. Now you have passed out from these shadowed lands, by unknown ways to seek the light of lights. Still the pale winds whirl mist across the sea, and white gulls cry and rain beats on the sands. But you are away, among the strange delights whereof the unquiet waves sing endlessly. Now, Maturathan, remember that name, it's going to come up a lot, is the title of her second volume, published in 1917 to good reviews in the Manx Press. The title indicates things that are washed up on the shoreline. But there's really nothing haphazard about these poems at all. They are beautifully worded, and there's miles of shoreline, and quite a few hills, and quite a scutch of fairy beings. The next poem is one of my favourites, and yet again, the gulls are calling. But look below the surface. She's seeing the natural world differently than many of us might. So this is gulls. O oh, birds with the strength of the sea in the way of your flying, white birds with the cry of the wind in your wild mystic sum, the glamour of far away oceans about you is lying, the spell of the waste in the wilderness where you belong. Close under the rocks, where a fold of the shore has enshrined you, you float in the shadows, your beaks to the turn of the tide. Grey shadows yourselves, with the dim glow of sunset behind you. You linger and watch in the mist, till a low light has died. Is it souls you can see, coming out at the ebb of the water? Is it crying you are, to a flock of invisible birds, that gather and circle above you from every far quarter, and sing? with low voices, call you with wonderful words. So, by the time she was in her early 20s, she had produced three volumes of poetry, and the last one, Endura, tiny volume, was published in 1919 on the island, unlike the other two. The Manx title, Dura, means something like an added extra, a bonus if you like. Well, it certainly was a little different from the previous two volumes. It was openly nationalist rather than pleasantly patriotic. And part of the difference is that the po some of the poems are in Manx, quite radical really at the time. 
She writes of heroic figures from the Manx past, but most significantly about the recent events in Ireland. So here's a couple of verses from the poem called The Awakening Easter 1916. And I'm sure you'll be aware of the significance of, of, of that date. From the west, there shines a light in our night of darkest need. Through the darkness, answering gleams, leap as dreams from souls that bled. Kinsmen of the shining west, your unrest wild hearts have shared. Soon from our land too shall rise through wild skies, a singing bird. Well, this search for personal, artistic and national freedom were all linked to Mona, but it's fair to say it was probably not the majority view on the island at the time. Seeing things really differently was her own form of rebellion. For me, the poems in the Dura seem a little forced, I have to say, but Ireland has already made her mark on Mona's psyche and it will continue to do so. Uh, Walter Gill, who I mentioned earlier, came up with the Karen's remark, writes to her in 1918. You describe the island as you see it and feel it, and it is largely the way I see and feel it myself yet perhaps not exactly as the Manx people do. But who knows what is in their hearts? Who knows who did? Christopher Shimon, who was a major political figure in the emerging Manx Labour Party and later MHK for Peel, had been a great friend and supporter of Mona's mentor, Sophia Morrison, and had moved in similar cultural circles uh, to Mona. But he felt the young idealistic Mona needed reminding there were people with real day-to-day -day struggles. In 1920, he warns her that if she doesn't use her considerable gifts to become, quote, the mouthpieces, the tongue of the inarticulate, then won't be tied you. <laughs> well, Mona was a poet, not really a politician, and she went where the muse took her. And as they say now, you have to work to your strengths. And she had many. Her abilities as a reporter, secretary and organiser, the editorship of Mallon, had already been noted. Mona had first met the antiquarian and passionate William Coven as a child. He had encouraged her reading of Mount's history and folklore. First a journalist, he later became the new uh, li well, the, the librarian at the new Mike's Museum and eventually, of course, the director of the museum. Through contacts with Coburn, by 1919, Mona was working at Russian Abbey as secretary. The Abbey was a growing tourist attraction with its strawberry teas and its uh, fantastically famous jam factory, so she would probably have been busy. I remember her telling me with a great chuckle how, as she sat typing at the Abbey, her feet were hovering in the air above the bones of the kings of man. <laughs> Well, yes, we were in the right, right zone, I'm pleased to see. Living in Balasala during the week, and from there, sometimes cycling some distance to collect songs, Mona returned to Balarak at weekends. In Balasala, she set up a little drama group with the local scouts and guides, and they put on dialect plays, one of which, her own, The Churning, I appeared, as did my sister there, yeah. <laughs> in about, about, no, about 50 years down the line, I should say. Um, but I, for some reason, I had to uh, wear an original, authentic costume, which came out of a very old leather suitcase. And even by 1919, I could see it was probably already somebody's great-great-grandmother's. <laughs> I will never forget those curly-toed leather shoes and the impossible to fasten bodice, so I think we put our weight in the intervening 150 years, for us uh, Manx women. Mona's early plays were often written in dialect, and few of her poems were, but there was one in particular that she always recited at Guinness's parties uh, in the late 1970s. 
She knew it by heart, and I think she loved it. Billy the Dollar. It had first appeared in Manon it, way back in 1915, so it is an early one. And Billy was one of the characters she'd previously met on her rambles. So it would be Billy the Dollar. I don't think he lived up there, but you get the idea. When Billy the Darlin' was living alone in his little white house up the highland, there were stories the lure going a-telling on us that the lick wasn't heard on the island. But Billy the Darlin' has gone to his rest, and his house has left sitting alone, with a street full of conjug and weeds on the thatch, and the kitchen as bare as a stone. He'd be telling the fairies of witches and all, till we trep her the heap to the Cholach, for fear we'd be too the big old began that was coming around in my mallet. But Billy the Dolan has gone to his rest, and his stories have gone with him too. Only his other ones work in the field by his house, and getting his bones from the brew. Now Billy the Dolan is buried and gone. But this one say the fairies go crying around his old house with the wind in their hair and keeping and sobbing and sighing like wishing him back from the church shouts again for old Billy was friends with them all but he's rest and respectable under their mouth and he'll never be hearing them call Heavily involved in reporting for the Celtic Congress Mona had made a friend in the Irish academic, oh, Professor Agnes O'Farrelly. She'd arranged for her to go to Dublin to study librarianship and to take a course on ancient Irish literature. Not a great surprise there. This was in 1921, which of course was a tumultuous period in Irish history with the War of Independence just still going on. Mona told how she once hid the fleeing Eamon de Valera, no less, in a wardrobe to escape from the British when they came to search the building where she was staying. Well, whatever the story behind that, she certainly made the acquaintance of a number of people who were significant in the Irish struggle for independence and others involved in the literary aspects of that. So during her year's stay in, in Dublin, Mona met George Russell. He was a friend of W.B. Yeats, and he was widely known as A.E. to Cabot Murchison. A great encourager of the young writers, he suggested to Mona she should make greater use of the Celtic figure of Mananan, the sea god, as a symbol of the poet in the society, of the creative principle of the art, and of course, of the island itself. But she was already well on the route to doing that on her own volition. So I think we'll have an extract from a vision of, uh, from a poem called A Vision of the King. King, of course, is Mananan. And this is from Maturachin, um, from uh, the, the, the earlier poet, but the earlier uh, poetry, second volume. And then one came from west with swift and splendid, circled with light, his eyes a leaping flame, and all the wandering fairy voices blended to shout his name. The shining of the sea about him drifted, I heard the fairy shout, Manana, ring, high in the air, and all my heart was lifted to greet a king. Round him rain mist wept over hill and gary, and in the mist there, whirling fire, Crowded with all the shining hosts of fairy and circling higher, a flock of seabirds from the fairy ocean winnowed the air with swift, tumultuous wings, white as blown spray. They climbed with fluttering motion in flashing rings. <laughs> seabirds! <laughs> seabirds again. Mananan's familiar spirits. Both A.E. and Yeats were theosophists, and theosophy promoted the international brotherhood of man, the study of art and science, all kinds of religions, not necessarily opposed to each other, and the mysteries of nature. It touched on Buddhist philosophy, visions, 
spiritual and psychic powers, and it attracted large amounts of converts from the 1880s up to about the Second World War. And Mona was also attracted to this sort of thinking. Other Irish inspiration came from Maud Gorham, later McBride, and she was, of course, Yeats's early beloved and muse, and strongly connected with the events of 1916. In the early 1920s, she talked with Mona about the importance of working with young people and promoting the native language and culture. And Mona's later formation of the youth group, Edel Fannin, the Young Max, in 1931, came out of that contact. So uh, thank you, Lord Gold, indirectly. Another Irish person who had huge influence on the course of her life was A.P. Graves, a writer of popular songs. If you know your Manx National Songbook, um, there are some very strange songs. Manxman, Manxman, bold, submit you to my steel, but I never will, oh merciless McNeil, or fair maids of man, of foreigners beware. Uh, they intended to be humorous. Not perhaps the greatest writer, but he was popular. But he was also a very influential and active Celsus, and he had Manx connections. The Graves family had moved permanently to their holiday home in Wales by the 1920s, and Graves' poet son, Robert, had not long written his wartime experiences in Goodbye to All That, and his father now wanted to write his own autobiography. And for this, he needed an assistant. So who did he ask? Well, Mona. And off she went to Harlech on the north coast of Wales and lived with the family there for three years. Robert and his own circle of arty London types were regular visitors. Lawrence of Arabia would pop by. Graves Senior was a great encourager of Mona's own work too, and going from the evidence um, of that period in her letters and notebooks, she was very productive then. I think the beautiful coastal environment suited her. So here's a poem which I think might have originated in Wales, in spite of having acquired Goodmanx title of At the Len when it was eventually published on the island. But wherever it originated, I think it's a good one. It's quite pared down, it's a later. And it's in the repetitive form of a rondo, um, not just a musical expression, poetic expression, things that go recur as recurrent bits, so it's appropriate. Okay, can we get the next one, Phil? Yeah. So there we are. Here she is. Well, we've oh, got somewhere over there. I can't actually stay. We're somewhere around here. Um, <laughs> Margaret's Beach, possibly. I have my reasons to suspect it might have originally been back. But anyway, it's called Apple Red now. The sea is loud upon the shore, golden the sun through swathes of cloud. Although the wind cries out no more, the sea is loud. White seabirds gather in a crowd on desolate fields about our door. The pale sea wraps us like a shroud. The sea is loud. Grey sedges voice their quiet low. The tall trees by no breeze are bowed. With storms to be, storms before, the sea is loud. Well... With her work with Graves complete, um, he suggested that she should try and advance her literary career in London. But um, before that, let's get her back to the island, for she didn't really stay away for very long. She always seemed to be coming and going, coming and going, repeating that pattern of her early childhood between Liverpool and the island. So when she wasn't in Wales Island, or later in London, where on the island was she actually walking for inspiration? Well, she had her favourite localities, and I'm afraid to say Castletown was not one. Because I'd got you. Any trip southwards was, in her words, tasting travel. How distant and bare it looks, she says in one poem, talking about down here. Well, the southwest coast and the uplands do actually get a reasonable look in. But the North is very much her favourite and most fruitful territory. Now, Mona had somehow uh, received some art teaching in Liverpool as a teenager. 
She told me she wasn't a very good artist when I asked her, but she was knowledgeable and very friendly with the Port Erin based artist, Hoggart, who obviously had no problem with our bare southern climes. <laughs> but if Mona had been a visual artist herself, and that's quite a fun game to, to play, if so so was an artist, if so so was a musician, what would they be? Well, if she was an artist, could be an artist, I think it would have been in the style of Archibald Knox. She revered him as one of the greatest Manx people ever. The very title of some of her own poems suggests landscape paintings. Andreas Dunes, the Corrupts, Chibifera, Pure, and more. They're full of light and shade and mystery. Quite painterly. Now, on her travels, you never hear of Mona being tired or getting sore feet. <laughs> she certainly covered the mileage, though. Sometimes on the bike, usually walking in her earlier life. Occasionally, she might encounter ploughmen in the distance, the turnip field. The outlines are blurred by mist, or, or there are distant figures in a fishing boat are fleshy. But she never gets too close. And if there are buildings in view, they tend to be abandoned, thousands. Sometimes, rabbits or birds, ice, sheep and other creatures cross her path. And as they are fellow creatures, she gives them an honourable mention. So here's just one verse from a meeting, by the way, where a little brown mouse pops out from the hedge and stares at her. I thought, little brother, I'm glad you are not afraid. You are friendly and bold. Then let it be gain to you. We will sit in the sun and be happy and share our bread. So I passed him some crumbs and to kill this tail, fell to him. This. If human beings are fairly thin on the ground, she often encounters themselves, the otherworldly beings hitherto referred to as fairies. Mostly, they don't linger. Reference to the fruits of Mona's own folklore collecting fairies are, though, to be found in certain poems. The Nickerson, for example, is a feared water spirit of London with a track record of luring uh, young women into deep pools and drowning them. But if Mona's poem of this name, you feel he might just have been understood, misunderstood. He is the ultimate outsider, a loner, part of the high watery landscape, perhaps in that way, a version of Mona herself. So this is the Nickerson of a man from, um, by, uh, from Mature Hood. Well, I know where water gushes out among the hills, banks, the crimson heather flushes, pleasant streams that hide in rushes, deeper dubs that winter fills. Well, I know the high glen reaches where the mountain frees, turbid water, black as leeches, groping for the distant beaches downward under shivering trees. Wearied with eternal questing for an end unknown, here I wander, never resting, while the latest birds are nesting, till the loneliest winds have blown. Behold, oh, I long to be asleeping in the wind rock sea, hearing not earth sleeping, feeling but cool moonlight steeping through the dreamy depths to me. So there we are, Mona as Right. Meanwhile, back on dry land, by the end of the 1920s, Mona was doing secretarial work in London, as Graves had encouraged her to do. And although the hoped for literary breakthrough didn't happen, she was, as ever, pushing Max culture into the paths of new people. By now, she had established relationships with the English Folk Dance Society, and she was liaising with the composer, Arnold Foster, with regard to the publication of new settings of Manx folk songs. And she was also learning meditation, attending classes in theosophy with Annie Besant, the radical suffragist and peace campaigner. So this is a good time to hear a poem from that period, which was first published in the very prestigious journal called Poetry, of all names, 
in America in 1920. It still is the the prestigious journal. I have to hope. But you know, you, this this is the one we all wanted to get into. One Ezra Pound was the was the editor at one point. Anyway, this poem of Mona's was published there, and it must have been quite a coup, I think, for her. Um, later, it was published in her own um, her own uh, collection. So this is called Seawood. Oh, thank you, Grandad Kizik. I found it. <laughs> I found a sketch of my granddad instead. Uh, well, in this no booth, it looks all right, just let it come. Seawood. Under thick veils of light, all colours light. Muffled beneath the clouds, the winds cry. Only the white edge of the sea is clear, and the sound of water on rocks comes sharp to the ear. Slowly they come out of fathomless depths of light, waves like blue flames curling to white, one on a dark point spilling like milk, one on the smooth sand folding like silk. Fallen away from life is the heavy land, only the sea is left and the bare strand, and spray of broken waves filling the air and light caught in the water and held there. One thing about Bonus poetry that impresses me, uh, and it took me years to actually realise this was going on, is that although she's using rhyme all the time, it's, it's often so stuff will un understate and you don't actually notice. I think that's a really good thing. In the early 1930s, Mona came back to the island permanently to become an excellent librarian for the Rural Library in Douglas. By now, she was collaborating with school teacher Leighton Stoll to teach children her newly reconstructed Manx dances. She was running the youth movement, Ergel Fannen, giving talks and folk customs, putting on plays and pageants, communicating with the organisers of national festivals, working for Nsheshit Gilgach, the Manx Language Society, and building up friends and connections all over the place. She had her new devotees too, such as the Welsh composer E.L.M. Pritchard, who sent some of her, set some of her mature poems to music and he entered them in assorted uh, Welsh nationalist Edford competitions. She, he quoted several times, was his muse. He knows to have, he knows to be a muse. Like, oh, that's, <laughs> maybe. After Endura in 1919, her own her next poetry collection didn't actually appear until 1938. And that was called The Island Spirit. And it's a collection which, in my opinion, take, contains some of her best poetry. And this one, in Wind, called Winter Moon, in this, she gradually transforms our own capital, Douglas, into a place of extraordinary beauty. And I've got to read the whole of this. <laughs> I like it, um, I suspect Douglas has changed somewhat, and that is definitely not a crescent moon, but you, you the nearest we could get. <laughs> so, Winter Moon, Douglas from Island Spirit. It's quite long, um, but I think it's worth it. All day the wind has veered between north and east, and this bleak town has suffered squall on squall. The swept the bay long after the high tide ceased flinging the rack up over the sea wall. Along the promenade, tall houses stand, shuttered and gaunt against the winter gales. The great dark head thrusts out beyond the sand into a sea blown clear of smoke and sails. But now the wind falls southward, clearing the sky, and here, between the fringes of the storm and the full night, behold, a radiance lies that moulds the town to an enchanted form. The wet sands glisten darkly, gathering night absorbs all harsh, unlovely things and leaves only a cloudy blur, shade of light. The lighthouse splash and the pier light that weaves a red and wavy pattern on the shore the smaller house lights all along the tide. Dark shapes grow most vague that were most clear before. 
and all the tumult of the day has died. The climbing streets are veiled with an airy fold of mist, and over the head is a clear space where the free sky suddenly glows faint green and cold, and one small star suddenly shows its face. But now, Lo hung in that translucent pool of fathomless air, the crescent moon appears, and the storm-beaten town grows beautiful, absorbed in delicate light. The earth bears the shadow of the beauty that is born beyond the tides of life, and is but known in fugitive moments, when the wind and the corn or a wave or some small lovely thing has grown until its wonder overbrims the world and finds the eternal beauty in the heart. What times the limits of being fall apart and the white sails of the spirit are unfurled. Now, I have, here you will see, she made quite a use of the word island. <laughs> Confusing, so, the one I'm going to talk about now is this one, the secret island, which I've got hot in the This came out in 1943. It's a book of verse and a verse drama, and the latter is a sort of poetic play, bringing Mount's legend onto the stage in Mona's house. So, for example, we have the verse drama of Teevil of the Seed, which is a tale retold by Sophia Morrison, and based on an ancient Irish legend of princess washed up on Mount Shores. It was first performed in Douglas in 1935. Years later, we, I, <laughs> performed it in Ramsey. Again, the cast seemed to have been required to wear original costumes and they were falling to rags by the late 1970s. I was the voice of a wave an action, I have to say, was a bit thin on the ground, even for a wave, but I love the words and I did find it quite mesmerising. Now, along with the plays in that middle book there, The Secret Island, features three longer, rather, you might disagree with me here, but what I think are heavy duty poems, perhaps appropriate material for wartime, for one of which, The Things That Endure, came the striking couplet which I opened, with which I opened the talk. We have sold beauty for a wordless thing and killed the bird of joy upon the wing. Now, in this volume, Mona embarks on travels that go into very deep, strange territory, a pilgrimage through an inner landscape, a symbolic landscape, tall towers, high mountains and lakes. This is not laxy, folks. <laughs> this is very Yeatsian. Here is the soul travelling to meet its maker. Um, the title poem, The Secret Island, I'm so called that, comes with a helpful forward to those of us like myself who are not of the theosophical persuasion. The Secret Island is familiar in Celtic folklore and mythology. It has many names, High Brazil, Clownus, Chirnanog, some of them. This is the place to which Mananan departed with his wise host when the visible Isle of Ours became too crowded with human activities to remain. Now, if you are a Lord of the Rings fan, you might see parallels here with the elves departing the growing materialism of Middle Earth. You might not too. Now, um, I'm hoping if Phil can find the right track here, we're going to hear Marlene um, Hendy now Masker, and her setting of some verses from the secret island with Charles God in the, in the background. Two verses. By the way, Time's Literary Supplement loves things pups. <laughs>
relieve Charles to disappear into the mist then. In a way, it's a relief to come back to the tangible world and some good old Manx weather we have today. I'm going to read the first two verses of a poem from her final, finally fairly short, but not tiny, volume, which is called Island Magic of 1956. And again, I really like this volume. It's worth reading, I think. It's got good poems in it. Um, and yes, the following poem, I think, is about more than rain, though that's its title. So these are just the first few verses. Oh, and I couldn't find one with the rain, so that's the rain coming. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. Now has the rain begun, after long frost and sun. Again, slow, heavy clouds inhabit the sky, and grey lights break over the sea and die. Swollen streams burst their bounds, frozen fields melt, and in sear woods where only the bare trees dwelt, innumerable small lives waken and stir, and a new pulse of gladness throbs in the air, and the sharp, dank smell of wet earth brings nascent dreams to birth. Over the hills I pass, glad as the springing grass, as a munching sheep for the sweet largesse of rain, feeling its cold, soft beat on my face again, smelling the faint, dream-stirring scent of burnt gorse, blindly giving myself to the element's force, for the wind blows from the west and the sea cries and low trailing clouds sweep through the skies and some hidden spring in me akin to the storm breaks free. Now you might see a connection between that hidden spring breaking free with the knowledge that during the Second World War, Mona's life took an unexpected turn when she fell in love with Italian internee Nicolai Giovanelli. Nicky, as she called him, the Brown, as they called him in Balaric, compromising height, went on to become her very great supporter, advocate, friend and partner. It was an unconventional relationship. A flamboyant character, Nicky was married twice and not to Mona. He would spend summers with her at Balaric and then he would return to the continent most winters. But their companionship endured and he was a regular presence at Egle Fannin when I was learning song and dance from Mona in the 1960s and 70s. In fact, he, along with Jack Irving of Peel, taught us fencing. I say life was never dull in those days. So I might... oh. Way back, well, back to the late 1940s, early 1950s, a joint venture with Nicky to run a farm up above Balaric proved a financial disaster for her. Mona, on her own for long periods, would rise at the crack of dawn to see the animals, then head off for a full day's work, resuming her farm work on return. She must have been exhausted, and after this period, it is perhaps not surprising if no really new poetry emerges. Well, in her 60s, Mona, oh, sweet. Uh, Mona took on a new career, as well as doing this in the garden, uh, as a newspaper reporter. So that was like her, her next long-term job. She was a filled milieu, suddenly tearing down the island in her mini, regarding the arrival of the steady and traffic lights with great irritation. Yeah. She wrote popular and accessible articles on Bank's history in a series of books and in the early 1970s brought out three editions of a new cultural journal called Mamanach, in which poetry and arts were given prominence along with the, the language and um, the history. And this was a sort of version, an updated version of Sophia Morrison's Manon. Um, I think she funded it herself and couldn't keep going. It's very good if you can get hold of it. In the late 1970s and 80s, she wrote two novels, probably not her best writing, and the arts, uh, I'm sorry, two novels, produced and performed in plays. She gave talks. She appeared on radio and television. She dealt with the comings and goings of Nicky and helped him write books of his own colourful exploits. I think she was his personal ghostwriter, really, not so much of a ghost. Um, 
As he often said in public, sometimes to her embarrassment, he was the Latin fire to her Celtic mysticism, but I think she did agree. <laughs> she was never happier than when providing hospitality at the cottage where, at her wonderful ginses, singers, tellers of tales gathered, ideas were discussed, visitors of all ages and from all nations were welcomed, and there was dancing under the stars. In 1982, she was awarded an MBE, accepting on behalf of the Manx nation rather than as a personal honor. In 1987, a few weeks before her death, she received the highest award that the Welsh Gorsedd of the Bards could give, and that pleased her. And posthumously, in 1988, she was awarded the Rye Glena Van Annen, Van Annen's Yearly Choice Award for Outstanding Cultural Achievement. What a, yes. Well, appropriately, of course, I do think that um, Van Annen might well have felt he owed Mona something by then. <laughs> Some of what she did was controversial. She's been criticised for her collecting work that she might, to a certain extent, have been making up certain songs and dances. But, you know, making up is what writers do. Don't trust <laughs> Perhaps by understanding where she's coming from in her poetry, you'd be able to understand this blurring of words. So, worlds, rather. It's blurring of the, the, the worlds of uh, imagination and cold, hard fact. Some legacies of her later years were truly successful. Her initially single-handed effort to revive and reinvent the Uncluniath Manx Music and Language Festival after 50 years, and that took off in the late 1970s. New Manx songs and dancers, music and dance groups emerged to, I think, everyone's surprise, but not bonus. And like it or not, many of her own songs and dancers, whether conventionally collected, partly restored or completely invented, have passed into the canon and are much loved. And Manx culture generally now is very much a creative arena, and thank goodness for that. A one-time secretary and lifetime supporter of Uncheja Gilga, the Manx Language Society, Mona would have loved the fact that Manx is now taught widely in schools. She would have been delighted with the strength of the Bunskull Gilgath, the Manx language school. She always campaigned about Manx education, Manx Gaelic education, and Manx historical education all of her lives. Now, those sort of sum up, this is a bit personal, but these, uh, these sort of sum up how I and Jenny there met Bet Bona and the sort of activities we were doing with her, you ended up some very strange things. That's Claire Kilgallen, Claire, Claire Stone, me, and assorted other people. Annie Watkins is in there somewhere in one of those photos. Um, there we are, Tinwell Day in Amanx Tartan. Now, here are some people who were de very definitely part of the legacy of Mona there. Charles and his harp, still going strong. Um, Christine Teer from Castletown. Of course, Charlie Carouche. We think that's Claire Falls, but we're not sure. That's me, and there's my dad looking over there, <laughs> looking over there for some reason. And here we are in Laxey, um, and the Mann family, along with myself and Mona and Charles at some do. And this strange wedding picture here. <laughs> we uh, were reenacting a bank's wedding, and for some reason we didn't understand. So uh, I'm the best man. <laughs> <laughs> In, in Nicky's grown-up son's velvet jacket, Claire Kilgallen is marrying uh, her. And um, that's Jenny, dressed up, my sister there, dressed up, looking mortified. And I think that might be one of the Watkin girls. Anyway, yeah, growing up with Moon was always very interesting. So I've given you some opinions, some like, might not agree with the things. But later on, if you, want to, if you want to ask me anything about Mona, please do. We'll finish off with the long rest that she was due in this life never came. And I don't think she ever really expected it to. But here's a poem from the final collection, Island Magic. And perhaps it's an, a suggestion for an exploratory walk this summer. And it's a poem I hope you'll enjoy. 
I certainly did. So thank you, Katie Newton, though she's not here, for the, for the photo. Clythena. A green, pleasant place is Clythena and Glen Rushy. Green and quiet, even in stormy weather. Full of the low and dreamy voice of the river and the far high sound of the wind over wastes of heather. Stumbling across the hills on a misty evening, I came on it suddenly in a burst of light. Green with grass and tree, where the bog and the moorland stretched out lonely and dim towards the night. I thought, I should like to live in this place forever. I could sit on a stone and watch the river run past and be quiet and learn the intimate speech of the elements and forget the restlessness of my heart at last. I will watch the sun and the moon rising and setting and the changing shades of the slopes as the seasons roll. And out of the strength and loneliness of the mountains, I will woo peace and contentment to my soul. So I thought. Then, through the quietness round me, remembrance grew, dreams that grant no rest. And down in that green and quiet glen of the mountains, I heard the wild sing, moving out to the rest. Thank you very much, everybody.